Hi everybody, welcome back to CMN 201. This is for our class for Thursday, the 3rd of October. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the final project, which is not due until the ending of the semester, though it's always a good idea to begin thinking sooner rather than later. And honestly, you've got a rolling deadline, so you can hand it in at any point in the semester. The ending of the semester is the last date in which you can hand in your final project. So if you were to reference the syllabus and other documents folder, you will see that I have uploaded what would have been a handout that I would have distributed to you in a face-to-face -face class. And that in the original conception that I had about the final project, it would be an analysis, probably a written paper of approximately four to five pages in length about the role of horror film in media and popular culture. However, this does not preclude more um, oral and or video submissions. So you can do something that's a little bit more creative. This is a medium popular culture class after all. So you can utilize medium popular culture in your final project. Mm -hmm. I think I might have shared with you some of the final projects that students have submitted in, in the past. For instance, I've had students film um, their own short horror movies and submit that along with a explanation of what they were doing and why they were doing it. So that is something that is a possibility. I've had other students give presentations to the class. That's going to be a little bit tricky because we are an online class, but if you can think of a way to go about doing that, we can certainly talk about possibilities. You might want to perhaps do something that's a bit artistic. So I had a student once who made some models of famous iconic horror film scenes. They actually are on display in the GCC library. And one of the models is actually from The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, a film that at this point, you understand how important is it is in terms of the genre of horror film, but also just in terms of German expressionism as well. So in other words, you've got a lot of possibilities of how to proceed with the final project. Though most students, I can say, do your traditional academic paper. So if you're going to do a traditional academic paper, my suggestion would be approximately four to five pages in length, but as long or as short as it needs to be in order to support your particular thesis. And that would be double space one inch margins. So hopefully this is something that you have examined previously in other English classes, such as English 101, which is a prerequisite for this course. However, as the semester progresses, I'll also be talking about some conventions for writing papers. Hopefully it'll be a review for you. And I've just generated some general topics you're free to choose any of those or create your own. And you'll note that I didn't give specifics. That's part of your job in developing the thesis. So think of the topics that I've suggested as merely suggestions so that you can adapt, combine, or dismiss. And it always makes sense for you to talk to me about what you're thinking about doing for your final project. Definitely, if you are going to do something that deviates from these topics, you want to talk to me about possibilities. And the syllabus talks a little bit about paper formatting specifications, what an academic paper looks like, should be typed Again, double space with one inch margins, a cover page, which is just a, a separate sheet of paper that lists information such as your name, my name, the paper title, the due date, um, the MLA, Modern Language Association, the professional organization that comes up with these rules for um, disciplines in the humanities and languages, and that also includes our class communications, basically indicates that you do not need to submit in a cover page unless requested. So I'm requesting a cover page. But again, we'll talk about all of these details later. What I'm more interested in is you beginning to start to conceptualize some ideas for what you could devote for a um, academic final project. 
whether you wanted to focus on symbolism. And in just the two films that we've seen thus far, you see that there is an incredible amount of symbolism. So perhaps you might want to focus on a particular film and analyze its symbolism or popularity. So discuss and why horror films or a film in particular is popular in our culture. Or perhaps you might want to do more of a historical analysis, examining the historical progression of horror film in our culture, as much in the way that I have structured the class as a kind of decade commentary. Or fears and anxieties, examine how and why horror films express our social and cultural fears and anxieties. So those are some ideas for you to play with. And uh, obviously we began with the doctor with with the cabinet of Dr. Caligari and we talked a little bit about how it was a wonderful example of not only German expressionism but also is considered to be the first feature length horror film. And we talked about all of the horrors associated with insanity, some of the gothic conventions that would have been included in the film, some of the possibilities of supernatural elements, and some of the symbolism that could be found in that particular film, as well as political and social commentary. And then we move to Dracula, and Dracula has the distinction of being considered the first American horror film, since The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari is a German film. And I had indicated that the Library of Congress has identified Dracula as culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant. That was your attendance question. And it seems that everyone is in agreement with the Library of Congress assessment. And I have to say that I'm in agreement as well. And that not only is Dracula credited with being the first American horror film, but I, I think it's so ripe for interpretive analysis. And of course, Dracula the film was based on Dracula the novel. So some of the symbolism of the novel transfers over to symbolism of the film. One of my favorites is thinking about Dracula as a kind of blood-sucking capitalist, which um, is draining the life force of the masses, which I think works particularly well for the 1931 film Dracula because we would be in the midst of depression. The idea of evil foreigner, a kind of reverse imperialism, is something that we will see also in our upcoming film today, and that happens to be cat people. And it's a common theme in horror film that anything which is considered other or alien is basically considered to be a threat and is considered to be evil. Obviously, Dracula is rife with sexual symbolism. It was written, the novel that is, during the Victorian period, a time of great repression. So at uh, in terms of the time period, it, it's not much of a stretch to read Dracula as a commentary on some of the repressive nature of their society. Um, I always think of one scene in the novel where one of the characters feels that she's being so risque because she's walking in public with her husband and they're holding hands. Yes, they're married. So when you have scenes of penetration and the scenes are quite detailed in the novel Dracula so that they seem almost orgasmic um, when the Dracula or, or a vampire is basically penetrating its victim or even the death or the way to kill a vampire is also through penetration. It's hard not to think about sexual imagery. The corruption of female and it's easy to see that most of Dracula's victims are female of the British aristocracy. Note that no one really cares when um, a girl who is uh, basically a street peddler is a victim of Dracula. It's only when the upper echelons of society are victims of Dracula, which has oftentimes been read, again, as a commentary on immigration and imperialism and colonialism. And the idea that the purity of bloodlines could, in fact, be tainted by immigrants or outside forces. And meaning that the women of the society were particularly susceptible. Issues of life and death, and if death is indeed one of our greatest motivators for fear, 
It's certainly the greatest unknown that probably exists. And flirting with the idea of everlasting life. And notice that there's a cautionary tale here. At one point, Dracula says, ah, to be dead, to be really dead, how wonderful that would be. There are consequences um, to eternal life. And it's, if nothing else, unnatural. The past invading the present. This is a common horror film motif. Think about how this worked with the mystic Caligari that supposedly influenced Dr. Caligari. How this works certainly with old world Romania. And if you were to read the novel Dracula, you'll see that definitely the old world is presented as rather archaic and backwards as compared to the world of modernity, which would be represented by England. And this past represent or this past invading the present, which would be present day England, is something that we'll see in all horror films that you can't really outrun your past. Um, science and religion, the Van Helsing figure, is absolutely fascinating because he's able to meld scientific reason with spirituality, specifically Christianity. Obviously, Dracula is a film that's heavily influenced by Christianity, and I would argue so is Cat People, and I will, I will talk about that shortly. Um, just the mere fact that Dracula is wearing a medallion that could be seen as a, a kind of star of David, I think illustrates the point that anything that's considered non-Christian is considered to be a threat and an alien force. Obviously, the idea of the animalistic nature that exists not only within the Dracula, but within humanity as well. You'll get more of this, actually, if you were reading the novel. Of course, the film has been simplified um, in terms of length, and also in terms of plot structure, the novel is usually told through letters and newspaper clippings and journal entries. It's known as an epistolary format for storytelling, which is notoriously difficult to be able to do on film, which is why we get a straight narrative. And we even get the combining of some characters in the film. Again, I think to simplify things um, so that as many actors don't need to be hired and also to reduce time. And certainly the idea of Dracula or the vampire by being a metaphor for the spreading of disease, not that necessarily Bram Stoker would have been thinking about something like a COVID-19 or an HIV, but obviously this idea of epidemic and pandemic through, um, in this instance, the exchange of bodily fluids um, the vampire by or through other exchange of bodily fluids with other diseases that have plagued mankind. It's not too difficult to see a parallel there. And lastly, Dracula is just a beautiful movie. The, the costumes, the sets, the cinematography really led to, you know, this sense of, of what we expect with gothic atmosphere. And not having a soundtrack, I think, actually adds to the film with this kind of eerie quietness to it. Um, notice that we've moved from silent film to talkies, but it's going to take us a little while to get from black and white film to color film, not until the 1970s, actually. Where we are now is thinking about the 1940s, if I'm using Dracula as a representation of the 1930s. And perhaps this film is not as iconic as the cabinet of Dr. Caligari or Dracula, though I think it should be. And it's called Cat People. You may have heard of it before. You, you may have known that there was a sequel that was done in the late 80s. Um, it is very much filmed in the tradition of film noir, so that if you know anything about film noir, then you know that it relies on the use of shadows, the use of mystery, and it's, it's a beautifully shot film. And I think one of the reasons why it's so um, progressive for its time is because it deals with psychological issues, which certainly the previous films have as well, but I don't think any film that we've viewed thus far, albeit we've viewed only two films, have done this specifically in relation to female sexuality. 
Though, of course, it's kind of hard to see Dracula attacking his female victim in bed and not think that this is some sort of commentary on the corruption of female and female sexuality. But the idea that the female sexuality is something that needs to be repressed. It needs to be controlled. Um, and if you think about the time period and the threat of female from the 1920s to the 1940s, it was a radically different world. Um, women can vote now. Women have basically um, been involved in the war movement. Um, as the men were shipped off to fight in war, what you've got is a female workforce. And the threat that that could in, um, impose upon a male-centric society, I think, is very much illustrated in something like Cat People. Expect lots of atmosphere, which is what you get with film noir. Lots of fog, lots of shadows. It also has the distinction of being the first film to offer our first jump scare. It happens to be a bus scene. I think you'll know it when you see it. Um, the sound is going to be suggestive of a sound of a cat. And obviously, even if you haven't seen the film Cat People, you can determine that cats are going to be important in this film. Cats come with a lot of symbolism, lots of superstitions, lots of negative superstitions about black about cats and especially black cats, um, evil omen, evil fortune. Though the cat was also revered in Egyptian society. It was a kind of God. And I, I think we'll see this film sort of playing with both of these ideas, but expect to see lots of cat imagery, some subtle, some not so subtle. The film itself is going to be very subtle very ambiguous so that we can't have the possibility of a supernatural explanation but we can also have the possibility of a naturalistic explanation we don't necessarily have that kind of subtlety in the film dracula in the way that it was filmed but if you were to read the novel you will see that at the ending of the novel there's doubt about whether any of the events can really be verified because it's, it's basically just a group of people who have shared journal notes and and who have shared newspaper clippings and you know group hysteria which is something we'll talk about when um we talk about other upcoming horror films it could be an explanation of course lots of psychology involved here so i think that sigmund freud the father of psychology had great influence in films such as cat people um we see a kind of also reverse darwinism so if you know anything about darwin he had talked a little bit about evolution. What you see is a kind of reverse evolution, a reversal to ancient traits. And that also includes an animalistic nature and a sinful nature. Um, the idea of that we have a duality, we know that doppelgangers are very common in horror film and that our lead character can both be evil and virginal and which would suggest pure and um uh, holy um at the same time um is very much indicative of duality we've got two female leads who are basically vying for the male lead that's also another element of duality um if you know anything about jekyll and hyde then you are very familiar with the idea of a dual nature of both positive and negative being possible within the same time period. Um, the terror of intimacy, not just sexuality, not, not just the physical intimate consummation of relationship, but, and you will see this, that in, in many ways our main character is guilty of an affair, not necessarily a physical affair, but an emotional affair. And perhaps that's even worse. There's one scene even um, where a fireplace is burning very brightly. This is where um, the main character's wife has decided that she's ready to be intimate with her husband, which is the main impetus of the film, is that these two people marry, but the main character is not ready to consummate the relationship. She comes from Serbia, in other words, and a foreign land. And in her foreign traditions, um, the idea of the folklore is that female could be dangerous if she were aroused, whether she were aroused physically or she was aroused emotionally. 
and that's the reason why she's um trying to make sure that their relationship not be consummated when she's finally ready to consummate it her husband has moved on to basically his workplace colleague again showing the threat of female in the workplace and one of the things that can happen is that a uh, female and workplace can ultimately destroy family um of other colleagues uh, but nevertheless, that that workplace colleague by the name of Alice, she even at one point says, um, I'm a different kind of other woman. Um, this film, much like all of the films that we've talked about and we'll be talking about this semester, very much deserves multiple viewings. I suggest one viewing just for plot, the second viewing for analysis, third viewing before you're going to do some detailed work about the film, whether you're writing about it or you're analyzing it for perhaps a um, final project. Do note that the film has oftentimes been read as a commentary on sexuality and not necessarily heterosexuality. Um, so there is this undercurrent of lesbianism in there and that that's the reason why our main character does not want to consummate her relationship. At one point, there's a woman who is known as the Catwoman in the film and she appears wearing a, a fur coat, very much indicative of a cat, where there's an exchange between the two of them that would seem to suggest a kind of possible erotic tension. Again, all very subtle. Nothing is directly stated in this film. And it is a literary film, even though it's a horror film. There's reference to John Donne, who's a very famous English poet from the 1600s. And a quote of his, but black sin hath betrayed to endless night, my world both parts, and both parts must die. So expect to see Christian symbols. One of my favorite images happens to be when our main character, Oliver, is holding up a T-square. Um, he's an architect and he's at work when there appears to be some danger. Um, and that T-square we see in shadow, it looks just like a Christian cross. And he even says in the name of God, you can't help but think of Van Helsing holding up his cross against uh, Dracula. Um, we get another table setting, just like in Dracula, there was a table setting that kind of looked like an altar and it almost looked like the altar that you would see in a church with a chalice and a Eucharist. And we will see the same sort of table setting when Oliver is sitting down with Arena. Um, there is what I, I'm fond of saying with a little snicker, a cat fight that goes on here that usually is termed a, a fight between two females. Um, and I'd say that Alice, the competition is much more predatory than this cat woman could ever be, um, who is portrayed very much in film noir um, uh, uh, a tradition as the femme fatale. Um, and there's going to be a good amount of Eurocentrism, a seemingly innocent scene with a black waitress serving the main characters and the waitress laments that no one wants gumbo. They want apple pie and coffee. Apple pie and coffee are as American as you're going to get. And in fact, Oliver even calls himself a good old Americano. So Dr. Judd, I would argue the psychiatrist is as much of a predator maybe the biggest predator of any of the characters in the film as he tries to initiate a, uh, an affair with um, Irina um, and says to her that you should tell a husband nothing. So some themes to look for, dark and light, evil and good, sexuality and chastity, things that we've seen in, in other horror film, and also a reference to old world folk tales, which usually have some sort of symbolic meaning to them. Symbolism, expect quite a bit. Think about a brownstone, which is where Arena lives, the idea of what is behind the surface of something, because this is a very psychological film that delves into the subconscious. The bird that's in a cage, and a bird is oftentimes a reference to female, the idea that female is encaged. The key, and this idea that there is a key to the zoo cage, you know, and perhaps this film is a key to unlocking our subconscious fears. 
the sword, and the sword is much like a stake, can very much be used as a kind of phallic symbol, perhaps a commentary on sexuality and what happens when female sexuality is relinquished. Um, the cat, there's a cat in the film by the name of John Paul Jones. This is no coincidence. John Paul Jones was an American naval commander who defeated the British, best known for saying, I have not yet begun to fight. This is very much an American film. And the idea is that anything that is not American, anything that is not Christian is evil. So those are some of the things to consider when watching the film. My suspicion is that few, if not none of you have, have, have watched this film. So I'm quite curious to see what your perspectives are. And that's going to be today's attendance question, which will be due in our class discussion forum on Saturday, the 5th of October. Though, as you know, if you need additional time, please let me know. And you're not required to respond to your classmates, but you are required to read their responses and my responses in turn. The attendance question is, what did you find to be the most surprising thing about cat people and why? Again, no right or wrong answers. Basically, I'm more interested in your reasoning. And of course, Saturday the 5th is also when your journal on cat people will be done, or will be due, I should say. And of course, if you need additional time, just ask me for an extension. I'll be happy to grant it to you. And I'm in the midst of grading your second journal on Dracula. So if you haven't received it back yet, you should shortly. So with that said, I'm going to leave you with watching Cat People. Um, thus far, I'm still successful in finding free links online. Um, if you can find a better link than I've been able to find that's for free online, please let me know because I would be very happy to share that with my students. We may get to the point of the semester where I will no longer be able to find a free link online, which means that the responsibility would be yours to watch the film. Um, all of the films are on reserve in the GCC library, so that's a way that you can watch them. And certainly you can stream them through streaming services or you can borrow them from um, other libraries so but thus far I've been fortunate in that I've been able to find a link so I leave you with the link for cat people and we will continue on next class where we move into the 1950s and the film for the 1950s and you'll see that I, I have a link below assuming that that link is, is still working i know that these links are violating now copyright so I, i'm always suspicious of how long they're going to be active but nevertheless our film for the 50s will be invasion of the body snatchers where we get to talk about some of the tensions of the 50s in terms of the cold war and also the concerns about alien invasion not necessarily from other countries but from other planets i hope you're doing well i'm doing well take care bye-bye